Okay, um, I, my name is Pat Knuth, and I'm the executive director for Arcot Seagull, and we're happy to host today um, Life Plan as part of a group of organizations in the Southern Tier. And we have um, representatives from Chief out of Binghamton, Shenango, Tioga, and Pathfinder Village, who are also part of Life Plan, um, here today to learn about Life Plan CCL. I'd like to introduce Nick Capaletti. He's the executive, the CEO of Life Plan. He's here today, and he is a parent. Um, he has a son who has disabilities as well. Um, and Carlene Stewart is the Vice President of Network Development. So now that we have all of our wonderful technology um, <laughs> working, um, I'll turn it over to Carlene or Nick. Who's going to Tag team? Collab. Tag team. We'll tag team. Good. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, we're being recorded, which is unusual for us, so I just <laughs> want to make sure that I'm doing all I need to do to make this You're good. good. You're good. Everybody can see. I'm usually pretty awkward, so this is just going to make it more awkward, so please bear with me. <laughs> so good morning, everybody. Um, I would like to welcome you to our family forum here in Oneonta. And thank you to our host agencies for helping us organize today's event. Uh, today's forum, will somebody be able to advance for me? Yep. Somebody will. <laughs> <laughs> Good. There we go. We went back. We went oh. Back. There we go. Yes, yeah, great. So today's forum will help you to understand the changes coming about to Medicaid service coordination. Explain what the change is going to mean for you or your family member. And then introduce you to Life Plan CCO and discuss the timeline for the transition for the services. So I'd just like to look out in this room and survey the room. And I see some of our MSCs in the room this morning. Joshua House, our at SECO. Uh, I see some family members in the room, self-advocates in the room. Moms, dads, some of our agency partners. So we have a really nice uh, group here this morning assembled to, uh, to hear what we have to say about the changes. Okay. All right, let's talk about the changes. So effective July 1st of this year, Medicaid service coordination MSC, as we call it, and I'll try to leave the acronyms out. The program that you currently use to access services is being replaced by a new service, a new way, a new model called care coordination or health home care management. Health home care management is very much like Medicaid service coordination. It will provide the service coordination that you or your loved one currently receive but it will also uh, add in some additional service provision coordination. So not only will you be working with your MSC, your Medicaid service coordinator, about services related to somebody's disability, but you'll also be working with them to talk about other services that you or your family member may need, uh, including medical or behavioral health services, even services that you might need to access in the community. These changes have been coming for some time uh, for a variety of reasons, so I'd just like to talk through some of the reasoning behind the changes. The first is because there were federal mandates that said that Medicaid service coordination had some conflict in the model. So what does that mean, it has conflict in the model? It means that the agencies that were coordinating services for people were also delivering the services that they were coordinating. So for example, um, I see Achieve in the room, so we'll use that as an example. Um, Medicaid service coordinators working in Achieve were working with families and people, and they were also offering some of the services that were a part of somebody's ISP or plan. And so the federal government felt like that there was a, a conflict of interest in that model, the way it was set up that folks might be more likely to refer to their own agency for services 
instead of looking across the entire community and saying, well, what other agencies are out there? What other services are available? What is the best fit for the person that I'm working with? And so they felt that because of that conflict of interest, it was necessary to take service coordination out of home agencies and move that service, so just that one service, to standalone agencies that are called care coordination organizations. So that's a lot, I need to take a breath. <laughs> so in addition to the conflict-free nature of the old model, Medicaid service coordination, that model was limited to just somebody's disability services. So like I was saying, it didn't take into consideration formally, even though maybe many Medicaid service coordinators would talk about those areas with the people they were working with, it didn't formally consider, oh, my jumped ahead. It didn't formal, formally consider somebody's medical, behavioral health, or the rest of the services. So Medicaid service coordination is now being called health home care management. And health home care management, I think I'm one slide ahead. Yeah, back there. So health home care management will be provided by standalone agencies, so agencies that only deliver one service, and those agencies are new agencies across New York State being formed this year, operational effective July 1st of this year, and those new agencies are being called care coordination organizations. So there are seven care coordinations in New York State. In this area, you will have a choice of care coordinations, and Life Plan CCO is the care coordination organization that the agencies that are on your flyer that, that uh, you may have received when you walked in the door today, so if not, they're, they're out front or we can grab some. The agencies listed on the flyer have aligned their Medicaid service coordination with Life Plan CCO. So Life Plan CCO is a partnership of agencies here in the Southern Tier. Agencies from the Southern Tier have collaborated and come together and are partnering with Life Plan CCO. The MSCs from the agencies listed on the form will be converting over uh, different transition times, but they will be converting over to Life Plan CCO. So your current MSC that's working with you should be your new, we're calling them care managers now under the new model. So we're looking for your MSC to remain with the same caseload. So if you're comfortable working with your current Medicaid service coordinator, it's our intention that that relationship would stay the same. And, and now they're gonna be called care managers and the CCO will eventually employ those MSCs care managers and you can continue to work with the same person you're comfortable working with. Okay, so beginning in April, Medicaid service coordinators, so this month, will begin discussing two options with you. So you'll have two important decisions to make. The first decision will, you will have to elect a CCO. So in most cases, people are deciding on their CCO based on where their Medicaid service coordinator is going to transition. So like I was saying, Life Plan CCO is working with those partnering agencies that are listed on the form in front of you, for the most, I see them out there. So down here in the Southern Tier, we we're working with nine different partnering agencies. And the second very important decision that people will have to make is a choice of service. So there is two different services. I mentioned health home care management. That is the service that is most like Medicaid service coordination. And then there is a lesser level of service, a very basic level of service, that will just maintain somebody's eligibility maintain an ISP um, and help them to um, maintain their Medicaid eligibility. So that lesser level of service is called basic home and community-based support, plan support. You will 
have to make those very important decisions by the end of June because as I was saying, the new model takes effect July 1st of this year. So I'm sure that you'll be making that decision much earlier than the last day of the month of June, uh, but your Medicaid service coordinator will be working with you to complete the necessary paperwork. There's gonna be a consent form that people have to sign off on so that you can enroll into a care coordination organization and there won't be any break in service for you or your family member when we move to this new model. Okay, so this is just a diagram to break those dates down a little further. So this month and, and into next month and the following month, all the way through the end of June, uh, MSC will continue, Medicaid Service Coordination will continue, and the new model will take effect July 1st. So I wanted to just break down a little bit what health home care management looks like so that you can see that it looks very much like Medicaid Service Coordination does today. So interactions, visits, calls, contacts, health from your Medicaid Service Coordinator will continue to be based on need. They will have a mandate to see people four times face-to-face -face every year but it will be based on me. In addition, the new model does incorporate the health, so medical, behavioral health, dental, any community services and supports that a person might need, transitional care. So we were talking to a family before we began today uh, who had a, a child who was uh, getting ready to, to move out of high school and into the next phase of life. So things like that, transitions to, to something new and different for folks, those type of services are covered under health home care management and they would be areas that your current Medicaid service coordinator would help with. So there might be other types of transitions if somebody has to go into the hospital or if they you know, injure themselves and they're receiving rehabilitation. So the Medicaid service coordinator, now the care manager, would help families out with those transitions. So making sure that they're linked to the appropriate aftercare. Advocacy, education, maintaining eligibility for services, linking people to services and supports in the community so that they can live independently. Health promotion services, all of those things are covered under the health home care management model. In addition to the new services, the new model will incorporate an electronic health record, similar to what some of you might be familiar with at your doctor's office. And this is to really help streamline the workflow for our care managers so that they can work more efficiently, less documentation for them to be uh, flowing, pushing around to providers and needing information back from providers that is usually in paper format. So all of those things will happen, but they will happen electronically now. So it will really streamline how they do their work. And it will uh, eventually mean that folks are, are communicating more efficiently and effectively. So that your care manager will, will know, uh, for example, if you went into the emergency room because there was an injury, they would, they would get an alert to tell them that that, that, that happened. So the next type of service, the lesser level of service, is called uh, basic home and community-based services plan support, basic HCBS plan support. So this is a much uh, uh, lower level of service that your care manager would be providing to you. And there are very few people actually in New York State right now receiving this level of services. So it, we anticipate that not many of you would probably select this lower level of service, especially if you are somebody uh, who is self-directing services, because it just would not provide the level of service that you would need to maintain a, pl a plan. And I think I had mentioned it's, it's to help maintain eligibility with Medicaid. 
And it also does limit your interactions with your care manager to four contacts per year. Sorry, I'm holding a microphone and I can't. I need another hand. <laughs> oh, there's a stand. Um, could you do the next slide, please? Okay, so we covered the timeline for the changes, and then we also went through the two different services, and the other choice you have to make, you have to elect a CCO. So now that we're gonna talk a little bit about who is Life Plan CCO. is local agencies that, that you know and trust. Um, so some of those agencies are listed up here today. And actually, Life Plan comprises 72 different agencies across a, a wide region in New York State. And some of the agencies from the southern tier are listed here today. So I just wanted to mention, because this has come up, People sitting in the audience are looking up at these agencies and they're saying, well, what if I'm getting community have or what if I'm getting another service and my agency isn't listed up there? Can I still go to that agency and receive services? And so the answer is yes. When we talk about our partnering agencies, those agencies have partnered with us for just the Medicaid service coordination service. If you are receiving other services from other agencies, they will be a part of our greater network of providers. And so that leads into why CCOs have to be large entities and why that really is beneficial to you or your family member, that a CCO is a bigger provider and why the state was moving in this direction where CCOs, there's only seven CCOs in New York State and that they are larger providers with a, a large membership. So we are where you are, and I uh, have the circle here where we drove today to Ontianta. But we are in all of these different, these different towns. Next slide. So the size, back to the size. Why, you know, we have seven, over 17,000 members as a part of Life Plan CCO. And almost 3,000 members down here in the southern tier in the counties that comprise the southern tier. It's important that CCOs have some considerable size because of, of the access to care. So part of the reason that the state moved to this new model to incorporate those other areas, so medical, behavioral health, and other types of supports that people might need is to open up larger provider networks. So part of my job when I'm um, done going out and talking to folks about the changes, the next phase of my job is to go out and talk to network providers about this new model. So we want to be sure that just because you live in Oneonta, if you need some type of care, medical service, that are, there's not a local provider that can offer this to you, that we have a network of providers that's available to offer to you. So maybe there's a service that you need, a medical service, a specialist, and there's not somebody local here in this area, and then we can link you to a provider in a different area, part of our 38 county network. It makes a lot of sense when we're talking to providers that we can bring those providers a large population. So I was saying we have 17,500 just about members, and so they, are, they actually listen when we say, hey, we have this, this uh, membership that we can bring you, a new, a new patient base that we can bring you. And it really allows us to fill some of the gaps in services that we're currently seeing right now with Medicaid service coordination. If this model stayed like it is right now, the agencies that are providing Medicaid service coordination, typically our agencies, you know, maybe have 300 members that they're supporting with Medicaid service coordination. And that conversation looks a little different when they're approaching a provider and they're looking for that provider to take a new patient. They just don't have, and I hate to call it this way, but like bargaining power to say, 
I can bring you a patient base that looks pretty substantial and providers these days are looking at those numbers to make <laughs> significant changes of what they can offer. So the services that we have listed here are just some of those services. So Life Plan has been um, in the midst right now, so not just me, there's a team behind me uh, in building the rest of the services. So not only medical services, but getting out and talking to school districts, because we were talking earlier to that family that has a child that's transitioning out of uh, high school. So letting school districts know that this model is available and what this model can offer the people that they're working with. Because right now a lot of school districts aren't informed about service coordination and care coordination and what the next steps could look like. So I think I had said that organizations here in the Southern Tier are co-owners of Life Plan CCO. And so what does that mean? Co-owners mean that we have uh, leadership from some of those agencies that are listed on your handout that sit around the board of directors. So why is that important? It's important because the Southern Tier has a voice in the decisions that are being made at the CCO level. Um, and the Southern Tier's voice is being heard by all of us, even though Nick and I maybe don't live here in this community, and, and I'm in Utica and he's, he's from Syracuse. The board of directors has representation from your community when those important decisions get made. So the agencies, again, uh, that make up our Southern Tier Collaborative have been very helpful in helping us to host forums like, like we are today. Uh, next week, we're down in, we're in Norwich and we're in, in Binghamton doing a similar type forum in, in those communities. And we just continue to spread the word about the changes. Another thing I want to mention is uh, please like our, us on Facebook because that's also a good way for you to receive information about the changes. We're pretty active on Facebook. Another way that you can um, receive more information, and then I'm going to hand it over to Nick, um, is through our website. So we're continually updating our website with information about the changes. And last, I just want to mention that the best way right now, if you have additional questions about the changes that I talked about, is to talk with your Medicaid service coordinator. And I'd really like to say to be patient with them. We're, they're being very patient with us at Life Plan, and I really, I mean, if I wasn't on mic, I'd like to give them a round of applause, those that are in the room today. No, let's give them a round of applause. You know, as we're building this new organization, you can imagine that it, it's, a, it's a big deal. It's a lot to figure out. And they've really been expected to be very patient with us as we've worked through a lot of, of changes and, you know, getting information piecemeal from the state, OPWDD, the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities that is overseeing all these changes that are being made. So our Medicaid service coordinators have really had to be patient with learning a lot of new skills and, and growing as Medicaid service coordinators into the new role of care managers. There's been a lot of work that's been done so far and that will continue, um, continually be done for them to be ready to support you in this new model. So I just want to shout out to our, our MSCs because Without them, you know, we have to take care of the people that take care of the people. That's how we view it. And so I just want to say thank you very much to them. And next, I'm going to hand it over to Nick. Thanks, Carolyn. Good morning. Um, I had an opportunity to talk to a few of you earlier. Uh, my name is Nick Capilotti. Uh, I thought Carolyn never let me talk. She, she, <laughs> uh, she puts me at the end. Uh, how many uh, folks here are uh, either self-advocates or parents? Good. Yeah, good number. Uh, well, I too am a parent. I have a 28-year-old son, Mark. Uh, he's in the picture. You'll see a picture of him. 
not the white furry one. That's my, that's his dog, <laughs> Charlie. But uh, um, and then, how many search coordinators do we have? Good, very good. Uh, well, welcome. Uh, I uh, I was a uh, search coordinator for seven years. Uh, that's how I started in this field, is uh, in developing an agency. And, and I certainly would agree with Carlene, the service coordinators bear the brunt of this change. And, and, and uh, it, it's, uh, they're so important, you are all so important to the lives uh, that uh, the parents and, and people who, who use these services, you are a critical resource. I know my son uh, is 28 and uh, his service coordinator has been with him for 14 years, almost half of his life. And she's helped us through many transitions, medical crises, behavioral crises, transition out of school, self-direction, many changes. She's been by our, our side, and, and so I certainly recognize. And my wife's a Medicaid service coordinator as well. So um, uh, it's uh, it's a role that we very much value, and that was one of the things that made it important for me to come to the CCO. Um, you know, it, as a parent, uh, I, I always say this. Uh, my son was born 28 years ago, a couple weeks ago, and uh, the day that he was born was the happiest day of my life. Um, but the day after, when the uh, uh, the doctors came in and, and told us about some of the challenges and issues that he would face in growing up, uh, was probably the hardest day of my life. And part of that was because. Um, all I could think of is, um, you know, how uh, how is his life going to be? What kinds of supports is he going to need? Am I going to be able to provide those supports? But then the hardest part is, what happens when I'm no longer there and I can no longer care for him? And I know that's a common concern and worry amongst many people. Um, you know, life plan, as Carlene said, uh, this is a change to the way we do services. Probably the biggest change we've had in, in probably 30 years of, of developmental disability services. And it's a change, but it's also an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to do things in a better way. And I know as a parent, and, and I'm sure many of you can relate to this, either if you're a service coordinator, or you're uh, a self-advocate, or you're a parent, it's very difficult sometimes to get the information you need to make good decisions. It's very difficult sometimes to get the resources you need um, when you're at different uh, phases of life, be it early intervention, be it if you're in a medical crisis, finding a, a, a dentist that can, you know, I know I, I went through all kinds of problems finding a dentist who was willing to, to treat my son without using restraints. Um, it, everything is more complicated, everything is more of a challenge. So the opportunity here with the life plan is that we will have the opportunity to really recruit good resources that will be at the disposal of or if, if, uh, uh, if, if the, if the, um, uh, to meet the needs of both individuals and families, but also to respond to the requests of the service coordinators, the care managers. Because one of the things that's so frustrating sometimes when, when you need those resources is they're not there. Or there's something in between you and getting that resource. Be it you can't get into their uh, practice, you can't get into, they don't take Medicaid, um, that you can't find uh, uh, disability services where and when you need them. So the opportunity for us here at Life Plan, uh, because of the network that Carlene is talking about that we're building, and because of our partner agencies, and because of our, 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 um, our, our size and, and breadth, that we can start bringing those resources to bear to help people, to help you and your family members actually receive the supports and services they need to lead lives as citizens of our communities. That's important. Uh, for a long time, people with developmental disabilities have not been the priority of of our state in, in Medicaid. There are a small population. If you think about it, in New York State, we have six million people who are, are use Medicaid. Only 130,000 people have developmental disabilities, less than 2%. So they're not high on the radar screen for focus and support. 
OPWDD recognized that, and by making some of these changes, I think we can actually get the voice that we need to advocate for the services that people deserve. Um, we know there needs to be a unique network developed because serving people who have um, significant uh, developmental, uh, physical, potentially behavioral requirements or, or needs, you need specialized services for that. And so this is an opportunity for us to do that. We can build on what works today, and we have a great services um, uh, network in New York State for people with developmental disabilities. We have committed agencies, we have phenomenal MSCs, and what we really need, though, is access to more resources and actually invest in the MSCs so that they have the skills and the resources so that when a family needs something, if an individual needs something, they can respond to that and do it quickly and, and, and ultimately improve the quality of life for somebody. I know, like I said, my son, um, you know, we've, we've gone through a number of transitions. Um, he's 28, um, he still lives at home uh, with our family. Uh, we have set him up with kind of his own independent apartment, that's a step towards independence. Um, but there's gonna be that point in time where he needs to take that next step. Because I know, like all parents, we're more, we're not gonna be there. And what we need to do is make sure that the quality of the life that the individual has continues well beyond our own ability to care for our children. And, um, and so that um, the service coordinators do not feel like every time a parent um, is no longer able to take care of their child that all of a sudden it's a crisis situation and we're dealing with the certified residential and we have to go run and try to find it scramble or we have people going into emergency rooms because their family member has died. That's not the way the system should work. Systems should work in a very planful way. We need to develop good plans, give people good information and not um, and, and not have to scramble for a family or an individual needs the resource that they need. So our goal is to do that. As Carlene said, you know, the state has approved seven organizations um, to be care coordination organizations. Life Plan is one of them. Not all, the seven are very different. Now, not all seven necessarily serve every county in New York State. There's only a couple that serve uh, this area. But even in of those couple of them, they're different. Um, Life Plan, first of all, is a collaboration of many agencies who are committed, who have committed um, their organizations to serving people with developmental disabilities. And, um, and, and they've got phenomenal resources that we will leverage as we move forward here. And so our members will have access to that provider network. And so if it's not just based on one agency or two agencies, it's actually based on, like Karine said, almost 70 agencies that comprise life plan. Secondly, we're regional in that we have a lot of regional representation in our board and amongst the providers that are sitting here today. So there's no doubt that, and our care managers will be local. They will be in the communities. But then on the other hand, we also are statewide. And the reason why that's important is because when a family is in crisis or an individual needs a resource, and we can't get that out of the local DDRO, the local OPWDD office, and we need to go to Alden, an organization that has 17,500 members, roughly 20% of the people in New York State that receive these services, when, they, when we go to Alden, we can advocate very strongly for that person. Um, we can go to healthcare providers and say, if you want referrals, you need to step up and develop the resources that our MSCs are saying that we need. If it's dental, if it's behavioral health, if it's, if it's medical, if it's housing solutions. We need those developed so that people feel safe and they know that when they're no longer there, they'll get those resources. If, when you have size, you can do that. In the current model, no one agency had more than a few hundred MSCs. And we were never able to really collectively join together to make that change. In, in this model, we can do that. So we're hopeful that 
you know, as we build that provider network, we can build those resources and link them together with the plans to meet people's needs. Because I know for my son, you know, he could be having, everything could be running very well. And then all of a sudden, there's one medical issue, one behavioral health issue, that all of a sudden puts us right into crisis. When we spent, two years ago, we spent almost eight months in crisis. And the reason why we spent eight months in crisis was because he had an issue, a medical issue, that was <coughs> undiagnosed or un <coughs> incorrectly diagnosed for eight months. That put us in such a tailspin. It put all of his services at risk because he wasn't able to take advantage of the services. We weren't sleeping at night. And, and we just kept wandering from specialist to specialist. We were even in New York City. And I'm a person that works for an agency and has connections, but I couldn't get him what he needed. And so my goal is that at the end of the day, he's going to have the resources he needs to be successful long term, and that you're going to have the resources you all need to be successful. And if you're a service coordinator, your job, hopefully, well, right now it's kind of going through this transition phase and you've got a lot being thrown at you. <laughs> But I know one of the things that frustrated me as a service coordinator, frustrates my wife as a service coordinator, is that when you're dealing with, and you know you're the lifeline for an individual or family, and they're in crisis, and you can't help them. That is probably one of the most frustrating parts of being a service coordinator, is that you've got somebody that you know needs help, and you can't get them that help. And so our goal is to build that, that infrastructure, that network, that we will be able to provide those resources faster. Will it be perfect from the get-go? No, it won't be. And will it be a little bit bumpy as we transition? Yes, it will. But at the end of the day, we have the opportunity to really make a fundamental change in the system that will benefit the people that we serve, their families, and, and our care managers who provide that care on a day-to-day -day basis. So. Um, that's, those are my comments, um, and, and I think we want to take some questions. Do we want to? Yeah, there's only one thing I forgot to Did mention. Did I miss something? No, I forgot to mention something. Um, I just want to mention that we are building, as a part of the CCO, family advisory bodies, yeah. regional family advisory bodies. So I was wondering if anybody in the audience today might be interested in serving on one of our family advisory bodies. And if you are interested, to please see me after, and I'll take down your name and contact information. Because right. that's going to be important, too. We want to be responsive to the people that we serve. So it's not just family advisory. We're looking for self-advocates as well as family members who want to take and, and help us shape what this looks like. What resources do we need? Because it's not just about even medical, dental, disability services. It's also about what community services what might we need in the southern tier that don't exist today. What do we need in Oneonta? Because what we need in Oneonta versus Binghamton may be two different things. So we need to have regional representation even within the geographies um, to tell us this is what we need in order to support people who live in our communities. And we know there's a lot of unique issues depending on where you live, be it transportation, be it access to services, um, support, um, medical, all of those things. So um, if we don't get that input, then we can't direct our energies to make sure that we are going after the right things to serve people in this area. And we'll certainly get that information from our partner providers, but it's also important to get it directly from the people who are affected by it. Want to take some questions? <coughs> Any questions? Yeah. Um, with the uh, help, the link, the internet link, will that be web based, so that each family gets a, that link for their person? Yep. Okay. So my brother would have his his mm -hmm. link, um, and then the um, the services that he's receiving. Would they be able to enter into information into that pile of resources? Right. Great, great question. Yeah. So we're we're going to be using a, a state of the art um, software system that um, has been developed specifically for people with developmental disabilities, um, and it will be the repository or the it will hold all the information that 
is needed for the person. So their plan, um, any relevant information about their health needs, their medical needs, their uh, disability services, their disability services plans, if they do self-direction, if they, they uh, uh, live um, in a supported environment, um, those plans, those services plans, ultimately will all be in the system. And the a level of integration or function will even increase over time so that it will even be able to, like Carleen said, if somebody is admitted into a hospital, the care manager will get an alert. So-and-so is in the hospital. Because sometimes, and I know this is true with me, when I've had my son in the hospital, first priority hasn't been necessarily to call my service coordinator. Right? So this way, they'll get an alert. Now, it doesn't mean that they're not important, they can't play an important role, but it's nice that they'll automatically get that. Now, the family, the individual and the family will have choices to how much information people see. They'll have choices to um, what, uh, who gets contacted. So you'll have all that ability. The individual and the family will have through the web, and it's all secure, and we have to pass all kinds of security audits, and we have to have consultants come in and make sure this all happens, is they will actually have the ability to go through the web and actually see the information, okay? And you'll even get emails alerting you that information is there. And then your care manager will also see that information, and then to the extent that the doctors or the other providers need it, everybody will be linked. Yep. So for those of you that that sounds very intimidating to have to go sign into a computer and access somebody's plan, there's still the old-fashioned way available. Yes. Your service coordinator, your care manager will still be able to print out you know, paper copies of everything for you to have in your hands. Right. And it'll evolve. We'll probably get more dependent or different than we become more dependent on the internet. Yeah. In, in the new, uh, Care coordination model. Is there also a financial component for the care coordinators? Will they, will they be assisting the families in um, getting the uh, best use of budgeted monies? Yes. Yeah. And, and you know, um, one of the key things here is that um, we have seen because you have 750 agencies in New York State and care uh, service coordinators work for all 750. Sometimes care managers really understand the funding mechanisms and understand how to educate families on how resources are allocated. Sometimes they may not. So our goal is to make sure that the care managers fully understand how all these services work. And as, as Office of People with Developmental Disabilities moves toward, more towards sharing that information and transparency on budgets and how much services cost, we can, we can share that information to them, okay? <coughs> so, like for instance, you know, as we go into, um, you know, we've, we've got some people that may not realize that they could self-direct <coughs> their budget or, or even how much services would be allocated to them if they chose to self-direct. We want to make sure that people understand that and that that's an option that they choose either to take or not take. Um, the cost of existing care is something that OPWD is moving towards making available to people. It's not there yet, but as it does, then the care managers will be able to share that. That's a goal that OPWD has to make that available. Will the care coordination model will that um, replace the, um, let's say, the fiscal intermediary model? No. Or they just work? <coughs> no. <laughs> and that's a good question. Um, all of people's services will stay the same. The only thing that is changing is the MSC role to the care manager role. So if somebody wants to do self-direction and have a fiscal intermediary, that's separate. Um, and, and they can still do that. They can still stay with whoever they are with, or they can make choices. Um, the care managers, though, what we've seen is, in, in, in this is part of what Carlene talked about, is we've actually seen where some agencies don't tell people that there are other options out there. They're, they're, they want to keep the services themselves. In the care coordination model, the care coordinators, the care managers will be in a freer position to share all options so that people really do have a broader choice. 
but services will remain the same. So no, ser nobody's services are being taken away. In fact, if anything, they're all staying very much intact. Yeah. 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 If you pick one, could you ever switch to the other or vice versa? Yes, you can. Like yeah. Services. You can. The, the two services, the question is if there's going to be two services to choose from in the next month or two, and, and if you chose one, could you switch to the other one? And the answer to that is yes. There's always the opportunity to choose. However, I'm going to tell you as a parent what I am telling people is that the two services are very different. So if you're a customer used to MSC, then you want to do the health home service. Because even though health home offers more, you don't have to take more. You can keep what you've got. But if you choose the basic, HCBS basic plan of support, that's very different. It's very limited. You may not even be able to keep your same service coordinator or care manager. And what you don't want to do is you don't, and, and I just tell people this, is that, you know, some people will say, well, I'm pretty independent, and, you know, I, I'm very educated, and I can, I can manage my son or daughter, or I can manage my own supports, or I do self-direction, and I don't really need that. The problem is, if you run into a crisis situation, and suddenly then you need somebody who knows you, understands you, has some history on you, has you fully in their system, you don't want to do that in crisis mode. So while you can pick and choose what you want in the health home model, and you can say, you know what, I'm good. I don't need you to get involved in that. But at least they're there when you need them to be. You don't want to be taking and having this very limited plan of support, and then all of a sudden, you know, you suddenly need something, or a sick family member can no longer care for you, or the person's in crisis and you need resources. Because then by the time you move over, while you can make that choice, it's not going to be as responsive as you need it to be. Right. There is a big difference. It's a good point. So contacted, and yeah, yeah. yeah, good question, good question. Are you going to rely on them to do that? No, no, no. Let, let me tell you how. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. Um, in, 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 I'm going to give you a, probably a little bit of detail here, is that when you sign the enrollment form, when an individual signs the enrollment form for health home, on that enrollment form, the service coordinator uh, will have put in there this thing called a RIA, which is, it's, it's basically which hospital network would be in, in your community, okay? So in New York State, every geography has one of these RIOs, okay? And the RIOs basically are this network of hospitals, so there's one for the southern tier, there's one for upstate and north country, there's one in Rochester, there's one in Albany, so there's multiple RIOs. All the hospitals belong to those RIOs. On the enrollment form, the RIO is there. So what this will do is, it will automatically link that hospital's healthcare system to our system. And so when a person gets admitted, we'll get an alert through the RIO. Now, some people have said, well, what if I get admitted to a hospital that's not in my RIO? Well, the RIOs even talk to one another. So there's another system called Shiny. Shiny. Shiny that actually makes sure that the Rios are communicating. So when this is all said and done, the alerts will be there and everything will be integrated. Yep, good questions. Hi. Uh, hi. Um, can you explain why if an individual uh, on basic, they would lose their Yeah, um, in, in part of that is because of the way in which the state is, is constructed the case <coughs> loads in the model. So uh, the uh, basic plan of care and support is literally like a minimal service. 
And so the average caseload that most um, CCOs are looking at is you, you may have 80, 90 people on your caseload because all you're doing is basically making telephone contacts, you may do four visits, but it's very slimmed down. It's even, are you familiar with plan of care and support? Yeah, I have several of my caseloads now. Okay, it's so even going to be. Right, and it's even going to be less than that. The state is actually saying in this model, the state really is discouraging. We only have, out of 130,000 people in our system, there's less than 2,000, less than 1.5% of them that have PCSS. In this new model, the state's really discouraging that, and that's why they even took the, the HCBS plan of support. That's even skimming you down more than PCSS. So they really are trying to discourage that. So they put reimbursement rates very low, <coughs> and, and, and we're trying to figure out, okay, how do you do this? Because what you don't want is that in, in the current model, you can kind of make some adaptions. <coughs> but in, in the new model, it's gonna be very hard for us to adapt how we support those people. Now, we may need to make some exceptions depending on location and region, et cetera, <coughs> but we really want you know, we're, we're trying not to encourage that model in this going forward. We have to, though, and some people have said, well, why are you even offering that as a choice? It's a federal government is mandating it. It has to be the, the low level. But at the end of the day, it's going to be very difficult for us to deliver any quality of supports under that model. Does that answer your question? I know it's kind of hard. It's a little different in... And it's one of the challenges. Um, we have a big problem now. We don't, but in Western New York, they have a big problem because they actually have a very large population, like a thousand people, are on planet care and support. So they're working very diligently to try to move them to this new model of health home. Hi. I have a, a piggyback off of that. Okay. So a lot of times, the reason we put them in PCSS is because they don't need us. And then right. we kind of push that way that after a while they see the billing that we're only. Right. If the people on my caseload that are in it would rather keep me in order, well, choose the <coughs> comprehensive in order to keep me rather than the basic, is there going to be an issue with you guys seeing that we're not billing for them that often and then saying, okay, this isn't appropriate, you should be put in another option? Yeah, good question. Uh, again, that, that actually, uh, uh, if, if you have somebody <coughs> absolutely, for whatever reason, is is so independent that they don't need to, then absolutely they can, a plan of support is the option for them. But we also have to look at uh, and explain to the individual that in the new model it's a little bit different because as an MSC, you're not just coordinating disability services. Now it's broadening out, so it's healthcare services and holistic community supports. So the opportunities for care managers to work with people and, and do other things for them is much greater. And that's part of the state's model that in the, in the new model, we've got multiple opportunities. Even, I'll just give you an example, providing a service to a person could be just updating their health record. That's a service. So you, you know, so there's, the, if you look at what's allowed under health home, and we can probably flip back to that, there are, multiple opportunities where you can provide a service or assistance to somebody that don't exist today under MSC. And you need to think about that. You need to think about what you could do for the person, sit down with them, explain that, and at the end of the day, if they say, nope, I just, I don't need that, I don't want that, then that option is there for them, right? But again, I, I always hear, er, encourage people, I know a family in Syracuse that was, Staunchly independent, self-directed, great family. Don't need it, don't need it, don't need it. And then the dad had a stroke. And it really put the family in a crisis. That's not the time you want to switch and, and I, I just I just tell people that's you've got to think of that. All right. Okay, so you said we have to pick between one or two. Right. The HHCM or the basic. Right. So then once we pick that, then we have to pick from these seven? No, you don't have to pick from the uh, Well, okay. Um, uh, 
first of all, you, you do both at the same time, okay? So in mm -hmm. either case, you have to pick one of the seven CCOs. So these are the and there's only, no, those are our partner agencies okay. that you're life pointing plans. to. Those are all life plan local partner agencies. Mm -hmm. There's only a couple CCOs in your region and your service coordinator will explain to you which ones they are, okay? And you pick which one will serve you and then you pick the service, okay? There's a question over here. Hi. Uh, okay, now, um, can the, the light plan, do they make uh, medical consent for the clients? Will we make medical Could decisions, you mean? Instead of going through SDMC? No, no. It, uh, there still will be that process. You're still going to go through SDMC? Absolutely. Yes. No, life plan is not going to be making decisions for people. They would facilitate that process when somebody needs a decision, but they're not in a surrogate decision making role. Well. Good question. Hi. Hi. So everything's going to be on this system. The um, new information system? Right. Yeah. So we're paperless. Well, we will be ultimately. Okay. But in the interim, uh, we're going to have a combination of choices, right? Because that'll still exist. In fact, you'll be getting, <laughs> are, are, are you a care manager or a service coordinator? And a parent. And a parent, okay. So you'll be getting from life plan information about what documents, and we're still waiting for a couple things to be clarified by OPWDD, <laughs> what documents you should be uploading a copy of to choices. Because every agency is different right now. We have some agencies that use choices for development of the ISP. Um, they use choices to store documents. We have other agencies that might use a different system, be a TheraApp or Precision Care. We have some agencies that are very manual and paper based. What we were originally told by the state is that the key documents that we ultimately they're going to tell us we need we would upload into choices and then they would be all uploaded in the, into the new health system. State's a little bit behind on getting that upload ready. So right now, we are going to give you instructions to upload certain documents into choices. And everybody's going to have, um, after July 1, depending on whether or not you know, your agency is subcontracting or you're moving directly over on July 1, you will have a choices password as well as a passcode to the new system. And then you can choose, or then you may need to access documents from choices. And then as we move forward and that information goes over to the new system, then you'll use the new system and you'll still probably need choices for registering people for new OPWDD services, doing DDP1s and, and potentially twos and fours and whatever. But then you'll be using the new system for managing people's plans. So it's going to be a phased in approach. So, okay, so this, to me, this is the most confusing part. Of it is confusing. Because um, consumers are going to need to have access to computers. And I, I was told that they might have iPads or whatever given to families. Then there's using a system that everybody's going to need to get trained on. I, I heard talk of Medistead, um, which... That's have, the name of the new system. Right, yes. I have no clue about this. And, uh, like, how are people going to be trained on this? And, you know, I'm not, I'm a, I'm a hands-on. I'm not a give me a piece of paper and show me. And a lot of the people I work with are the same. So this is very complicated. And then if families can access paper, I mean, can't access. They can use paper. It can consist completely they like it is today. Paper Absolutely. From who? Because Again, no longer are our own agencies going to be providing us with, because we're not with them anymore. We'd be with whatever, um, you know, CCO. Yep. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, as your agency converts, okay, uh, we're doing training now on the new system. Uh, you'll still have, you have access to choices today, correct? Yeah. Okay. And, and you probably have some system either using a, a Microsoft Office or you're using a TheraApp or Precision Care to create the plan, right? The ISP? How are you creating your current yeah. ISPs? Okay. Yeah. 
So you can continue to use that ISP in July, right? And, and, and then after you get the training, and your person, depending on when their plan is due for renewal, you can then use the new system to develop their plan. But you can use the existing copy today. What we're going to tell you on uh, is instructions on how to make a copy of that, scan it, and then upload it into Choices so that come July, you can still sign on and see it and print it. But you can hand it to a family. You, there's no requirement that a family have to have internet access. You can like, still so do things the way they want you That's to do That's what I want to know. Like, no. it's going to make the paper because uh, my agency is not going to be my boss anymore. Right. In, in those cases, a couple things. One is we're going to have, and we're working right now with agencies on either them continuing to host MSCs or moving to uh, our offices, depending on where you're located and what your agency wants to do. Some agencies are hosting. So the, cert the care manager can still work in the agency and use their printers, scanners, copiers. In other cases, some people are moving to our offices. And we're building or, or um, developing offices all over the place. Uh, but we're waiting because, again, we've had to uh, wait for the state to give us the go-ahead to move forward with the subcontracting, making those decisions, and then ultimately the care managers coming over. Do you know where in this area you're going to have your offices? Well, we might know after this afternoon. We're going to be, we're going to be looking. So. I mean, like we're out of Delaware County. Yeah. Again, we're going to work with you to figure out the best arrangement that works for you. I mean, we could have a hosting agency. I mean, we've got, trust me, we've got rural areas all over the place. We go up to, we've got one county that has only 10 people that will serve it. I mean, that's how few people there are in this county. So we're making arrangements. So sometimes, again, nobody should feel abandoned because our partner agencies all those partners are committed to making sure that you're supported and that the people you serve are supported. So nobody's going to be out in the street. We'll make arrangements with those agencies if, if it doesn't make sense for you to travel. And then the other thing is, based on the new system, we're going to provide every care manager, um, it, either they can use their current cell phone or they, and we'll give them a subsidy or, or they'll get a new one, and a, a, a laptop. Uh, with all the software on it so they can work wherever they want to work. So we already have many agencies that have people working out of their homes. And that's a choice that you can make. Or you can work out of one of our offices or a host office. So I know it's a little unnerving because I want these details all ironed out. I get that. Um, and, and I've got 22 care, uh, service coordinators who I've had in my old agency that are saying, Nick, what, what's the story, Nick? What are we going to be doing, Nick? It's like, trust me, it'll work out. No agency is going to abandon its service coordinators. You guys are too important. At the end of the day, this whole system revolves around you, right? It serves the person, but you guys are central to this. So we're not going to abandon you. We'll work with the agencies to make sure everything goes. It's going to be a little bit uncertain, a little bit bumpy, but... I'm going to tell you this, and, I, and, and, and you know, I just want the individuals and families to know this, that, as Carleen said, we have to care for the care managers in order for you to care for the people. And we know that. So bear with us during this transition. But at the end of the day, Life Plan is going to be focused on one service, and that's the service you provide. So you're going to be very important to Life Plan, and we'll make sure that we treat you well. So I, you have my commitment on that. Just I'm give it, it write it down, <laughs> write it down. Um, and, 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 and just be patient because, again, if we had more, if we could tell the state, ask for one thing, it would be give us more time to plan this. Unfortunately, the federal government didn't give New York State a lot of time to plan this. And July 1 is the implementation date. So we're, we're all in the race car going in the same direction. but. It'll work out.
You know, nobody is going to be without a job. Nobody is going to be without a care manager. I have one other part of my question. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, I know with all the change overs over the years, you know, it started out, MSCs didn't have a case load higher than 25, I think, was the maximum we had. And then it went to 44. CMCM, and we had all kinds yeah, of iterations, you know, and, yeah? And especially for people in our area, we travel multiple counties. I know. We travel major distances. And, uh, you know, what I would work with 16 people might be what somebody would work with 40. You know, so are those things going to be taken into consideration? Absolutely. Because uh, absolutely. You know, I, I recognize that. Um, and, you know, we, we've... We have to start somewhere. So we're going into this with a model. So, you know, if you're coming over directly to us July 1, you're going to be getting an offer letter from us. And, and then you're going to have questions. Okay, what do I do? What's my caseload going to be like? And how is this going to work? And I'm driving, you know, I'm spending half of my time in the car. We'll work with you to make sure that everything evens out, okay? Now, granted, the, you, you need to acknowledge that the system Things will be a little bit different with the new system and the services. Um, uh, things will be a little bit maybe more automated than they were. Uh, but at the end of the day, we want to make sure that you have caseloads that are reasonable and, and given your geography. Because we could have two service coordinators working for the same agency that have, you know, one has 30 cases in, in within five miles of Oneana and the other one has you know, 20 cases that are all 20 miles out. So it's going to be a different model, and, and we'll work with the supervisors to adjust those caseloads and make sure everybody is treated and compensated fairly. And I'm saying that this, you know, the idea behind the CCOs are certainly to hold more services together, to, to make everything more accessible, understandable for people, reachable, all that. Yep. Um, and to me, because I've been doing this many years, uh, I started out writing hand notes, you know. Yeah, I did too. I go back to the no, Bagger days. No, I did. So, you know, to me, I started in 2003. that you developed with the person. And, and I've certainly seen in a lot of the folks that I work with for many years that they really take a loss because they can't get me personally involved in a lot of stuff going on. You lose contact, you lose that personal touch, which is very important in the care part. You know, and I have daughters that, are, that have disabilities, and you know, I, I have seen that over the years with their MSCs, that they leave, they go to different jobs, and it, it, there's a disconnect, right. <coughs> which really impacts how the services come, because there's the disconnect. Absolutely. So to me, I'm just that's just my statement. Well, that, that's the most important thing to me. And, and I will tell you, and, and, and I, I fully respect the number of years you've been here because I think that's phenomenal. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of variation throughout the state in agencies. Some agencies may have treated MSC more as an entry level role, right? So they're more junior employees. In life plan, care managers are the profession. The profession, okay? So it is a career. We want to keep people in this career. Um, and, you know, it's going to take uh, some wa a while for us to develop a common culture because we, we are the conglomeration of 70 different organizations. But at the end of the day, the culture will be one to support the care manager so that they are supporting the individuals and the families. Because without that, this doesn't work. So, patience, and we'll get there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, good. Yes? I know this is crazy. I'm moving around. I'm making can, your life can, hard. Can, is that presentation on your website? It is. It is. Okay, so you, if I want to download it, I'll go for it again. Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, Thanks. there's a family tab, and under the family tab, family and individuals, if you click down, that's the information. Right. The form will be there. Right. And, and as we go forward, one of the things that we can do now under Life Plan, because we are serving more members, is we've actually hired a firm to invest in the website 
because we want to put more and more information there. You know, one of the things that we want to be able to do is actually have um, family education throughout our regions, um, individual education on key topics, be it benefits, be it services, behavioral supports. I mean, I, I heard earlier that you guys already have some great education programs to the extent that we can promote those via our websites and our Facebook and, and actually encourage it and maybe co-sponsor them with you. We'd like to do that because I know as a family member, you know, you, you can only take in so much information and you gotta go through it. You can't learn everything day one. So you start with early intervention and then the next thing is IEPs in school and then the next thing is transition and the next thing is so social security and guardianship and all those things and maybe supplemental needs trusts and estate planning and then and then housing and so there's all this information going every step of the way so we need to be able to create that, those resources for you to make good decisions and also that help, helps the care managers because they don't have to be experts in every one topic if we can if we can augment what you all do with experts on key topics then you can direct individuals and families to those topics and you don't have to be an expert on guardianship or surrogate decision making. You can actually bring, we can do video, we can bring in seminars, we can bring in speakers who can actually do that. It's hard to do that if you're a small agency and you've only got a few MSCs, but we can do that now. Yes? I have a question about those, fam those regional family advisory boards. Yeah. What's involved with that? So that, you know, when I speak to parents, that, you know, they know what would be expected. So are you talking about the time commitment or actually the activities? Both. Um, so time commitment, I wouldn't say that it's more than a few hours a month for, of somebody's time, but it's working within the communities, trying to get uh, get a better understanding of regional needs, if there's need educational needs that families would like to see. <clears throat> so bringing those topics back to life plan, working with our team to develop educational curriculum to bring out to families. Do we need to do more advocacy? Is there yeah. something missing in the community? Do we need to go work with the local government unit, be it the office, the county offices, or the um, OPWD regional office to say, hey, this area is lacking something, they need something, how do we develop it? Those are some of the things that we need to identify. I mean, we see them, you know, while mm -hmm. our care managers are going to certainly be a voice telling us what we need to do and what people need, it's also nice to get that directly from self-advocates and family members. Mm -hmm. So it gives us the opportunity to, to get that information directly. Mm -hmm. And you know, many of us are family members, and that helps, but we need to make sure we have regional representation. Because mm -hmm. <coughs> no two communities are the same. So we'll know better further down the road where... That'll get developed, yes. Yeah, we're yeah. putting in the structure right now. Okay. Yeah. So we'll be reaching out to our care managers and saying, who do you have who might be interested in this? Um, are there local groups that we can network with? Mm -hmm. You know, I've already gotten contacted by a couple of, of uh, <coughs> advocacy groups who want to partner with us. Uh, Sannies, we're meeting with the Sannies uh, in different regions, the self-advocates, so. Yeah, there you yeah. go, yeah. yeah. Right, because that's how we're here, mm -hmm. yeah. And you're lucky because some agents areas don't have that. So in some areas, we almost have to be that resource network. Mm -hmm. We really want to inventory each region to see what resources are there and then how to leverage them. So, you know, we're finding that we might find a real jewel in one county that another county doesn't even know about, and they're doing some great programming. Well, how do we open that up? Maybe they're willing to take other people. Yeah. And, and so to the extent that we can really maximize the use of resources, and we even find FSS uh, reimbursement agencies that have excess reimbursement. They're not even using it. Well, how do we how do we make that available to people? You know, yeah, it's been a great learning experience for us as we're out in the different regions and trying to draw upon what something good that's going on in one area and how do we bring that to another area that could really use it. And what we're telling people is, again, I want you to think about this. Nobody's losing anything we're actually gaining something. We're gaining the opportunity to build something new. And then the second thing is, this is not costing the state less, because some people have said, you know, is this the way to save money? It's actually costing the state more. So, or we're gonna spend more with the federal incentives, so. 
Any other questions? Hi. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Me and self advocate see RMSC or ODS. Why would you like take your like offices away before mm -hmm. they get the new offices in place? <laughs> we won't. We won't do that. We'll work with them to make sure they have space. <coughs> That would be hard for the residents that go there and talk to them. Yeah, that's a good question. Because it's like, that would be hard for the residents that actually go there and see the, the MSC switch to the RMC and see if the MSC switch to the RMC. Yeah. Because I know, because they might they take the offices away and make them work from home or something, but I don't think that would be fair to do that or add that. Well, in, in and I'm going to tell you, the, the MSCs can choose where they want to work, but you get to choose where you want to have your meetings. And that could be that the agency that the MSC worked at, I'm sure the MSCs will do that, and they may still work there. Or you could choose any place else you want to have your meetings. Concerns. Who still has anxiety? Okay. I do. Uh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> You're a little bit confused. I'm just going to tell you. Know, she just explained it to me. I want you to go and get nobody to take anything away. Okay? So you can call me if anybody comes. Okay? Um, because that's not the point of this. And we have to be careful. And no decision is a bad decision for people. If you don't like your decision, you can change. But this you do have here, we, we need to work with this group over here and make them feel more comfortable because I know it's, we're anxious, we're changing jobs. So we're all changing jobs, but we'll get through it together. And at the end of the day, we'll have an organization that really is very focused on what we do and is able to do this in a way that's never been done before. So. It's, it's, a, it's a journey that we're all on together. And we'll make it work. And, <coughs> all right. Thank you. Well, we'll be hanging around, so. Talk to you in case, please. <laughs>